Okay, today we have the host of Pod Save America and Love It or Leave It, John Lovett. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. You too. So let's start off with uh, with the Supreme Court, of course. The 6-3 majority has overturned Roe and 50 years of precedent. Now, if you, John Lovett, are in charge of the entire Democratic Party, what do you do right now, today? That's a, that is a good question. I would say that I am still, I think my first response to this is I think also a good response for politicians, which is let's all be people first. Let's all be human beings first. And remember that like, this is a, a very bad day for everybody who cares about this issue. It's even harder for a lot of people uh, uh, who are worried about their own access to care or who are on the front lines of providing abortion care and, and reproductive health. And so I think the first place to start is by just uh, uh, being honest about how difficult this news is for a lot of people. You know, we, we have some you know, members of the Crooked team that are in DC and they were out in front of the Supreme Court after the ruling came in. And there are a lot of people out there, they're protesting and they're angry and they're trying to figure out how to organize, but they also feel pretty scared and pretty lost and pretty worried. And it is especially hard when a decision like this is handed down by what is ultimately an anti-democratic institution. Uh, the 6-3 the court that was basically kind of <laughs> stolen uh, as part of a multi-decade plan to make this outcome happen. So I just start there and just remember that I am in a very privileged position and I'm obviously upset about this, but I feel for a lot of people that are really scared and really worried. And I think that's where you start. And then after that, I think we're where the, the, the appropriate place to go is what we can do right now to support organizations and groups and activists that are on the ground helping. I think that has to be that has to be uh, uh, the priority. That's just protecting access to care, protecting access uh, uh, wherever we can, supporting organizations that are, you know, in, in the case of Texas and a few other places that have already been dealing what it's like uh, with what it's like to live under a ban, and and letting those organizations take the lead in the best way to help right now. And then finally. Uh, you can turn to politics and where I start is there is a vast pro-choice majority in this country and our job is to wake them up and make sure that they understand the stakes in the upcoming elections. That's at the local level, that's at the state level, that's at the national level and making Republicans pay for what is ultimately not just morally reprehensible, not just they're imposing their own rigid ideology on people with whom they disagree, not just demanding that everybody live like them, but also making a great political error. We must make this a great political error that is about the Senate and the House and making sure people understand that we will either have a majority that will enshrine uh, bodily autonomy, the right to reproductive health care, the right to an abortion, or that will try to ban it nationwide. That is about uh, making sure at the state and local level that we were electing uh, not just governors, but also uh, 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 attorneys general, district attorneys that recognize our fundamental human rights, that recommend the fundamental human rights uh, and bodily autonomy of, of, of citizens and elevating this issue and then making it part of a larger story that ties together the, that the anti-democratic trend on the right, the turn against democracy on the right, with the embracing of extreme and unpopular and radical positions that demand everyone look and live and, and act like they do, whether that is forcing people to carry a, a, a rapist baby to term, forcing a child to carry a father's baby to term, whether that's what Justice Thomas uh, uh, basically explicitly said in his, uh, his concurring opinion, which is that he wants to revisit laws that would allow gay people to be thrown in jail for being gay. That is about uh, their desire to terrify teachers who are gay or terrify teachers to even talk about the existence of gay people. That is about making supportive parents of trans people afraid to live in states that are governed by Republicans. We have to tell that story 
about this radicalism and extremism and make that choice very, very clear to people. Because that is that is not only an, the, the, because the best message is the true message, and that is the truth. That's perfectly put. And, and to that point, you know, I think that Democrats should use this opportunity. I mean, so many people constantly and, and look, I'm part of that group, too, where it's like Democrats have a messaging problem. Change that today. Every Democrat should be out there today on TV, at rallies, in town halls, on podcasts, doing whatever they can to get this message out to people because this is a virtuous message. And if not this, if not this as a reason to go on all of these, you know, on, on a tour, basically, to, to reach every single not only voter, but low information voter, just person out there who doesn't think that politics impacts them, then 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 what? You know? Um, yeah. And we're recording, you know, we're recording this soon after the ruling came out and I'm still feeling pretty raw. And I, and I want to think about it. I want to think about what this means and, and figure out how people are feeling. You know, there's like we have to let people have time with what is ultimately an incredibly dangerous and damaging and and, and uh, um, frightening decision that I think people will need time to process, too, and figure out how they want to fight back and how they feel about it. And that takes time, too. You know, going into the political implications of this. Um, as we head into midterms over these next few months, you know, I know, I know Biden and Democrats are operating in an almost comically brutal environment. You know, there's yeah. worldwide inflation, there's high gas prices, a war in Europe, uh, an impending food shortage. We obviously have a 6-3 court that's rolling back civil rights at a rate never before seen in the U.S. And on top of all of that, we have a couple of Democrats who are protecting the filibuster and blocking any legislation, the entire Democratic agenda from moving forward. Do you think that the Republican Party, their work over these last few decades, but but concentrated into right now uh, to overturn Roe is is the message that Democrats should seize upon uh, as we move forward? Like in 2018, we focused on health care. That was a wildly popular issue that Democrats were on the right side of. It was a virtuous message and Democrats won 40 seats in the House. Is this is this what you know, is this what we should focus on in 2022 as as uh, you know, this midterm cycle's ACA fight? I think that's like an empirical question. I think at root, we want to find a way to create a choice between Republican extremism and Republican deference to rich people and corporations and the steps Democrats want to take right now to protect access to health care, protect access to abortion, uh, to help people with, with high costs, uh, and and tell a story about that choice that that on the one hand, you have Democrats who have been fighting to take on high gas prices and Republicans who have been trying to stymie what they're doing. On the one hand, you have Democrats who have been desperately trying to expand things like the child tax credit, but have zero Republicans willing, uh, uh, who have, well, who have uh, uh, often had zero Republicans willing to go along with any part of their agenda to make life more affordable for most families, middle class families, poor families. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the leader of the Republican uh, senatorial campaign basically saying he wants to sunset Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I think that's the story we have to tell. I think what this decision on Roe has to be a big part of it. And it has to, it has to be a signal, if not the most important, probably the most important example of the difference between what Republicans want to do and what Democrats want to do. One puzzle piece and like, a, and like their broader attack on democracy and the will of Americans more broadly. And I think, by the way, this their ability to do this and their confidence in doing this is just born out of the fact that you know they've been able to undermine democracy for so long that they don't feel accountable to people anymore and so when you're able to gerrymander districts to within an inch of their lives when you're able to suppress votes and close down polling places and when you even in democratic districts where you do have uh where you do have you know like counties where where they are democratic majorities when you can uh use laws like SB 202 in Georgia to replace those Democratic majorities with Republican majorities uh, as part of their elections officials. You know, when, when you have that much confidence because you've been able to subvert democracy for so long, um, I think that this is the uh, this is these are the consequences of that that we're seeing right now. And also, I, I also think it's, it's important not to, to miss believe they won't face accountability in the public square, that they believe that that the world has gotten so noisy that the mainstream press is so feckless and that the right wing press is so uh, um, loud and useful to them that they do not believe they have to worry about hypocrisy. They do not have to worry about honesty. They do not have to worry about taking these unpopular positions. And our job collectively is to prove them wrong and to show them that, yeah, we have headwinds against us. 
We have a broken system. We have a democracy that is being undermined at every turn. We have a political system that rewards dishonesty, that rewards politicians for evading tough questions, uh, that they, they pick their audience instead of uh, uh, um, being forced to put themselves up in front of people and, and face, face uh, the consequences of the, their decisions. Uh, but even despite all of that, we have an opportunity in this election to prove that like this engine may be throwing off sparks and it may be rumbling and it may be making noise and there may be, uh, 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 you know, nuts and bolts falling onto the road as we drive. But the, but the engine turns and the wheels move forward and we can win elections and we can and we can make this case and it will be a slog. And there's no guarantee here. It is a very hard road ahead of us. But like for your listeners, so like for your listeners who are paying attention you know, it's our job as people who kind of understand the stakes here to be ambassadors and leaders and making this argument and to not give up and to not be cynical and not to give into the kind of social media mindset uh, of, of cynicism. We have to answer this very hard moment by remembering that things can get better or things can get worse. Right. No, and we our choice, we have agency. Yeah. Um, and, and and that can be hard, especially in a, uh, at a moment like this. But uh, we have to remember that like, this is one moment. Things can get better or things can get worse. And yeah. we, when we have to choose. Now, one, one obstacle that we're going to contend with, obviously, that we have to, to figure out how to overcome is uh, Biden's poll numbers are low, especially with young people and progressives in particular. What do you think he can do to salvage support among those people? Because I, I think that we're teetering dangerously here between these people rightly recognizing how dangerous the GOP is, but also that Democrats are often too feckless to be able to beat them in the face of that danger. Well, one thing you should do is cancel some student debt. <laughs> you should probably do that yeah. today. Today's, as, as, we've, as, as many have said on, online, today would be a good day. But, yeah. but I, I do think that that's an example of what we kind of need. I think there's two things we need to see from, to me, what we need to see from Joe Biden. One is we need to see him using every lever of power at his disposal, every executive order possible, every action, every part of his administration needs to feel like a full court press to use all the power he has while he has it to make a difference for people. And I think that that is ultimately what they're trying to do. And I think as we get closer to the election, I want to hope we can see more of that. These, these steps that say, I, am, I see what's going on in the country and I'm using all the power available to me, not just because it will help, not just because it will make a difference, but also it because I think- people. It shows people, but also I think given- how look this administration has been hit been buffeted by so many external forces that it is doing its best to manage that were ultimately out of its control uh the, the joe biden is not responsible for variants he's not responsible uh 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 for anthony fauci is right yeah that's anthony <laughs> fauci is the one who's given us uh, us the uh, variants but you know he is dealing with a like he, is, he has been dealing with a set of international challenges, with global supply chain issues, with a, just a, uh, with a recalcitrant Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Cinema. that despite everyone's desire for him to be a king or to be an emperor, to have an, a, an incredible persuasive argument to them, he has tried and it is ultimately up to them, not Joe Biden, to decide whether or not we either get rid of the filibuster or, or use reconciliation to help the country. However, one consequences of that consequence of that is often it, Joe Biden is at risk of seeming like an observer, like a pundit describing what's happening in the country, upset about what the court is doing, upset about what Joe Manchin is doing, upset about what Putin is doing, uh, upset about uh, a, a host of other issues. And I think taking immediate actions wherever possible and focusing on the things he can do rather than commenting on what's happening in the world is a way you look less like an observer. And then the other piece of it is just helping make this argument being out there every day, making this argument about the choice we have in November uh, between an extreme right-wing, revanchist, Republican, authoritarian MAGA movement and a Democratic Party that actually wants to make some, some positive changes. And all you have to do is give us two more votes in the Senate and we can help make that happen. Keep the House, two more votes in the Senate and we can protect Roe, right? There's a, there's a host of, 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 of things we can do if we can, if we can convince people um, uh, uh, if we can con convince people to come along. I have a, I want to, I want to go in a different direction here. I have a kind of a weird question. Um, sure. L Liz Cheney's website is encouraging Democrats to switch party registration to vote in the Republican primary. 
Uh, at mm-hmm. the same time, you've got someone like Evan McMullen, who is otherwise what we would consider a conservative running as an independent in Utah. He's courting Democrats as well. In fact, the Utah Democratic Party isn't running a candidate uh, in hopes of, of um, you know, having someone like uh, McMullen beat Mike Lee. I'm curious what your thoughts are in these deep red areas in terms of siding with like pro-democracy conservatives who are very, very conservative. That's funny. I, that's a that's a good question. I would say that these are exceptions that prove the rule, right? Like I think that we have been, ver- you know, for example, Rusty Bowers, the uh, re- Republican Speaker of the, of of the Arizona House, he gives this incredibly moving testimony about the divinely inspired Constitution that that Trump and Rudy were trying to tear asunder. That gun, a person with a gun, came to his house and terrorized his family, including his dying daughter. And that this was abhorrent to him. And he had a moral obligation to stand up for the basic tenets of the United States of America. And oh, by the way, I would vote for Trump if he ran again. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Liz Cheney, I do not think we need to be defensive in saying that what she is doing takes genuine courage, that she is doing a remarkable service for her for her country, that uh, that she has shown honor where a lot of other people haven't. She also made a name for herself by vilifying Muslims and uh, campaigning against, <laughs> this is for, for people who remember this, making an issue of things like having a, a mosque in Manhattan, right? This, was a, this is a right winger. And it is important that there were barely a few, but a few Republicans who were willing to tell the truth about Donald Trump. That is really important and valuable. I would rather have Liz Cheney uh, in Congress than a Trumpist 100% of the time. However, I do not, uh, beyond that, I leave it to others to decide what they want to do with their time. Gonna, gonna need Does that make look, sense? Look right here at the camera and say, I'm John Lovett and I endorse Liz Cheney for Congress. <laughs> you, know what's, you know what's embarrassing? I wrote, when Liz Cheney was first kind of like trying to get her, get her name out there when she was uh, 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 um, at first running against Mike Enzi, um, and basically her campaign message was just like, I want to be a Senator. And I don't think Mike Enzi is, is not, is enough of an asshole. Like that was like basically her whole message. She like made yeah. some bullshit argument against him. Uh, I, I remember writing that, like, I felt like there was a chance Liz, Liz Cheney was the rock bottom for the Republican party. That was incorrect. <laughs> there was yeah. a low, but there was a hole at the bottom of the pool, you could go lower. <laughs> there yeah. was a lot lower to go than Liz Cheney, which is a lesson. There's always lower. Yeah, there's always we're gonna, lower. We're going to cut but, to it's 2025 and we're going to be sitting here saying, should, should we not vote? Should, I mean, should, we, should we vote for Marjorie Taylor Greene, though? <laughs> like, <laughs> to stop the, the lesser of two evils, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, yeah. So, uh, look, I don't know. It's a tough one. I would uh, I would rather have Liz Cheney than Jim Jordan in Congress, for sure. Yeah. You know, these are obviously dark times and this is an especially dark week and i think that uh you above all other people you know recognize the significance of being able to laugh so i want to switch gears here um a few weeks ago you told the story of the most embarrassing thing that you've ever said to obama so i created a segment that i'd like to call john lovett's assistant didn't give me a discernible heart out for this interview so now i'll ask him to identify the most embarrassing moments in a variety of different situations because in this era of crushing darkness maybe we can find some momentary respite and love its humiliations there it is okay great perfect sure whatever you want whatever else you can come up with i i i don't have a hard out but i will turn the zoom off at a moment's notice i don't i don't really care there's no consequences for me. what are you gonna do yeah take me to podcast take me to podcast podcast jail? court yeah at any time yeah um, All right, what do you okay. got? What is the uh, what's the most embarrassing thing you've ever edited out edited out of an episode of either Pod Save America or Love It or Leave It? Oh wow! What is the most embarrassing thing I ever edited out out of Love It or Leave It? I've called some pretty despicable men hot. <laughs> you've also done that in episodes I, that you've not. Edited I know, out. <laughs> but 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 there were, there have been a few moments where after an episode, someone's like, you know, you can't call him. You can't say that you still would. He's a monster. And I'm like, all right, cut it out. I agree. <laughs> I really wouldn't. It's a joke. You know? Yeah. I mean, it took until, it took until Madison Cawthorn did. Wait, what did, what did, what did it finally take Madison Cawthorn that video, to do before that you finally video, said he would It wouldn't. was so gross. 
it was it was so the video was so like when people like the video like where it was just this like actually i think i homophobic. sent that i think i was you the did. one who sent that video to you you did thank you for that i appreciate yeah. that breaking news it meant a lot thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> well I, uh -huh. I feel like i did a, i feel like i did a service to everybody because if that's if that's the video that finally that finally did it for you then uh then i'll you know i'll take some yeah. i'll take some modicum of credit uh Plus what's he lost the... and like that's not hot you know yeah uh uh-huh what what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened in front of an interview guest? Without, I'm not going to name names, but I will say that there was an interview for Pod Save America. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make this vague enough that it's, you cannot, can't pin it down. You won't be able to figure it out. Uh, there was an interview for Pod Save America, uh, and um, it, it was just it was kind of boring. You know, it was a boring one. It didn't get anywhere. And like uh, whatever host was doing the interview uh, tried to make something happen. It just kind of was like a politician on talking points. And you won't be able to find the person. because We've had a few politicians on talking points over the years. You know, it happens. And then uh, the interview ended and the producer and the host were like, oh, man, that was so boring. That person didn't say anything. Why did that? Why would that person want to come on this show and then just be so anodyne? This is a place to kind of be a little bit looser and like get to know people. To it's a better environment for that. And then all of a sudden we heard a, uh, uh, I'm still, I'm still here. Oh my god! <laughs> I have note taken. <laughs> I hear you. Maybe you're right. And that was mortifying. Oh goodness! Were you were you doing that interview? Is that you? I don't know. Well, don't maybe know. I was. Maybe it was. I'm not going to make. Yeah. It, you're not going to be able to figure it out. I guess this kind of falls into that category. But what was the most inappropriate thing that you've ever said to a guest, and did they take it well? Um, it remains to be seen. I I made some kind of a gay joke with with Secretary Pete, and I don't remember the exact wording, but I got some flack for it on Twitter. <laughs> People did not think it was respectful. And I hear that. I hear that. But it was pride. And if I can't do innuendo with a with a gay <laughs> secretary of transportation during pride, then the Republic, can Thomas has already won. Thomas yeah, and Alito yeah, already won. It. So no thank you. Yeah. Um, well, Tom, and Thomas, and Alito, Thomas and Alito have already won regardless. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I hear your winning. point. Yes, um, they've won even more. But so, And then one other one I would say is, um, uh, this wasn't a guess, but I was going to NASA for a a, a speech by President Obama, and I was riding in a van with Buzz Aldrin, and Buzz Aldrin said uh, uh, he showed me an article about himself, and then he was like, you know, I share a publicist with Barbara Streisand, and I believe I said something like, well, in many ways, I think of you as the Barbara Streisand of space, and when I say he turned red and looked like he was about to punch me in the face. <laughs> And I got so yeah. close to being yet another person pu punched by Buzz Aldrin. Yeah. Oh, I wish he had done it now. Now in hindsight, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm so close to I'm so close to having an all time story. But I didn't get yeah. the punch. We we we, we talked him down. We talked him down. Yeah, um, I feel like. Yeah, and the thing is, he would have been able to because those yeah. are the rules. When you go to when you uh, when you walk on the moon, that that's actually one of the uh, the rights Let confirmed to you. If Buzz Aldrin punches me in the face, he gets that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's what yeah. he gets. He can punch me in the face. For sure. Um, I, do, I do actually have one. I, I have one story. This is going back to the previous thing. What the most in, uh, embarrassing thing that's ever happened in front of a guest. I was interviewing um, uh, Jeff Daniels uh, because he had just uh, he had just done, I think, the Comey rule. And mm -hmm. uh, and I was using I was using a monitor behind my laptop. And I think I've told this story. So I apologize if anybody's heard it before. But I was using a monitor behind my laptop. And I don't usually do that. I wanted to take a selfie with Jeff Daniels over Zoom. And so I wanted to get it on the big monitor. So to mm -hmm. get it on the big monitor, I had to close my laptop screen and that's the screen that the zoom was on. And so by closing the screen, mm -hmm. it pointed the camera right down into my lap. And you bet. You not only was I wearing, not only was I, yeah, I pulled the tube in. <laughs> not only you didn't was pull I, not, no, I didn't, I didn't pull the tube in, but not only was I not wearing pants, I was wearing <gasps> shorts and not only was I oh. not, not only, yeah, I was, I was wearing shorts, but okay. they were jacked all the way up because I had, I had scooted forward in my chair. So yeah. all you so just a saw of thigh was action. Just a lot of thigh, lot, a lot, lot of white thigh. A lot of thigh, a lot of thigh. Whole, it's really dangerous the pulling, the, closing the laptop while the zoom's open. It really yeah. does 
It really does. <laughs> yeah. you know, it takes you on a tour, you know, it takes <laughs> Yo, you on yeah. a tour. A lot of, and the white balance, you know, kind of, yeah, you don't, you don't sure. see anything. So you don't even know what you saw. Uh, Jeff Daniels right. saw it and said, I, and said, I quote, I didn't need to see that. Um, yeah, that's right. Didn't. That's smart. That's a perfect so, thing to say, actually, when, yeah. when you, when, a when a host has shown you, uh, uh some, some, <laughs> some inner thigh yeah. out of nowhere, apropos right. of nothing. Here's the last one. How many people, okay. because I, I know you've kept count, uh, have gone to your show that, assu that uh, assuming that it was for level, uh, Lyle Lovett? So that's interesting. It's a fair number. I would say that a sizable portion of the Love It or Leave It audience are looking for either Lyle Lovett or John Lovett. It's a big part of my success. And we welcome <laughs> yeah. them. We welcome John Lovett yeah. and Lyle Lovett fans into the community. Uh, I will say this, which is um, a theater put Love It or Leave It with Lyle Lovett on their marquee. <laughs> and we had to get it taken down. And, and that show hasn't happened yet. And I don't know what's going to happen. There may be a lot of Lyle Lovett people at that one. Yeah. And that's not their fault because it said Lyle Lovett outside. So there's going to be some refunds and that's a shame. Yeah. Uh, we've had a few at each show on the road. LA, not, not so much. But it's more like when we were in like, um, you know, like there was somebody in, in, in Portland, a couple people in Portland, Maine, Maine yeah. a couple people in Texas. That'll happen in Texas, Dallas. Uh, uh, Houston. So, so it happens from time to time. And then actually it's interesting. Audience members think they're seeing Lyle Lovett. Guests are looking for John Lovett's. We've had a couple of guests be like, oh, I don't know what this is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what this show is that happened just like last week with Bob, the drag queen, like Bob, the drag queen was like, and I was like, you don't know what this is. You don't know what this <laughs> show is. You're at a theater filled with people. You were sitting across from someone you, that is a pure stranger <laughs> because you thought you were going to see the critic, SNL alum. Yeah. Uh, my stepmother is an alien, John Lovett. Yeah. Well, you know, the good news for these people who, who, you know, meander into the theater thinking that they're watching Lyle Lovett is, uh, they're prime, the prime, prime targets for, uh, to get Absolutely. them registered to vote. I don't know yeah, if we'll there's get a, yeah, get them registered to vote. They're probably not Some like inherently political. People. Some of the wild people are Republicans. We've had some, and, I, and I've checked in with them during the show. Like, is this okay? Are you okay with this? Yeah, yeah. I'm in. I'm. I'm. I'm in a skirt. It's a lot. It's a lot for people. Yeah. It's a. It's a. It's a. You know, it's not exactly the. Uh, the short. The. The short jump that they might need to to cross over. It's, it's a, right. It's a right. Big, it's a big. big it's a leap. It's yeah, a leap big for leap. Sure. Uh, well, in the words of John Lovett, uh, you've won the game. So thank you. Okay. All right, let's finish off with this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Vote Save America and uh, what you're doing, uh, what you guys are doing in, in Vote Save America for uh, for Roe? Yes. Yeah, so if you go to Vote Save America, there's a bunch of bunch of. Uh, so just for people who aren't familiar, Vote Save America is a resource, and our goal is to make it a like one stop shop for everything you need to know to make the biggest impact, both in terms of like what you can do to help right now, and then also how to organize and volunteer and donate leading up to uh, the midterm election. So if you go to Vote Save America, you can support our Fuck Fans Action Plan, which is putting, which is that kind of divides the money, goes directly to organizations on the ground that are trying to help, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of this interview. Should have plugged it then, to be honest. And uh, you go to, you can, go, you can do that at votesaveamerica.com slash row and find ways to get involved in that fight right away. Also at Vote Save America, you can sign up to be part of Midterm Madness. We have divided the country into four regions. You can pick the region you're in. You can pick the region you love, that you have an ancestral connection to. Uh, uh, West, South, East, mid Midwest. I am representing uh, uh, the, the, the Northeast because of Long Island as my ancestral home and because I picked a fight with Pennsylvania in 2018. Uh, but basically, if you sign up for a region, you will get ways to get involved in the big and most important races in that region. We're trying to get uh, 40,000 people to sign up so that we have an army of volunteers ready to go to help and make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to keep the House, uh, uh, keep the Senate, ideally expand our majority in the Senate. This is, these are tough jobs, but also, by the way, making sure that we are, like, there are some incredibly important uh, Secretary of State races. They're incredibly important uh, uh, local races that will be in, uh, and, and like from everywhere from the school board to, to election jobs that are about making sure that we have, uh, that we're fighting back against Republicans trying to take over these local offices, especially when a lot of these local offices will determine whether or not we can have free and fair elections. So please, please, please sign up. Uh, it, the first step, if you just sign up, you don't have to do a damn thing, just sign up. And then at least you'll have the option to see the best way to get involved. So please, 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 I'm begging you go to votesaveamerica.com. It'll get, it'll be a place where you'll get emails telling you that an easy way for you to get involved. So just do it. Love it. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Good to see you.
I'm gonna take advantage. Oops. Wow. <laughs> no pants, I'm wearing, I'm wearing shorts. So why did I have to see that? <laughs> 